Performance USA, the greatest entertainers in America, as requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command Performance, presented this week and every week, till it's over, over there. All aboard the Command Performance Streamliner, leaving Hollywood for all AEF stations on the fighting front. And at the throttle tonight, the four-star man of the Four Bell Pictures, Academy Award winner, and holder of the affection of all Americans, your master of ceremonies, Spencer Tracy. Thank you, Paul Douglas, and hello, fellows. And a special hello to five Marine Corps lieutenants at Midway Island. On May 26th, one of you fighting Americans wrote in from APO863 and said, We are a battalion of doughboys somewhere in the Atlantic. And if you folks at home will furnish the dough, we'll furnish the boys. And together we'll furnish a new home for the world to live in. Well, count us in on that deal, mister. And keep counting on us. So those three challenges take the count of ten over there. Now let's dig into those letters and start your big show. For Sergeant A.B. and his buddies at APO 957, for those five Navy ships on the USS Whitney, and for scores of you in places we can't mention, command performance gets rolling with Liza and lovely Mary Lee. Thanks to Lou Forbes of Selznick Studios conducting local 47's Command Performance Orchestra tonight. And now, fellows, here's a letter from somewhere on the high seas. Dear Command Performance, we are still fighting for Denmark beside the sons of all the Allied nations. So we like to feel that we can ask Command Performance our favorite entertainer, too. However, we do not write or speak very good English, but the man we ask for is our countryman, Victor Borges, signed K.A.R. Thanks for the letter, K.A.R. And don't worry about the English language. You should hear what Victor Borgie does to it with his phonetic punctuation. Here he is, fellows. Victor Borgie. When I came to this country about 19 months ago, I couldn't speak one word of English. Or any other language. And, uh... <laughs> I try to learn it as fast as possible by listening to people. When they talk, and they talk very fast. So all I learned was... <laughs> so I uh, tried to do the same thing, and I spoke very fast myself. <laughs> and uh, it went very good. But nobody understood what I said. So later on, I learned a few words, and uh, now I think I understand quite a lot. But still, I think that people don't understand each other. And I tried to find the reason for that, and I think I found it. When you write a letter, you use punctuation, commas and periods and question marks and explanation points. So if you write a sentence like, was I an idiot? And you put a question mark after, then it's a question whether you was or not. 
You'll have the same sentence with an exclam uh, exclamation point after. There isn't any doubt. <laughs> but it still is the same sentence. So how do you know when you talk what you mean? When you don't see those signs of punctuation marks. And that's why I invented the phonetic punctuation. It means that while talking, you use punctuation marks. And uh, I think this will improve the language. And I'll just give you a few examples how it would sound. Each little sign gets its own sound. So while you're talking, you use those sounds so you always understand what the sentences mean. Uh, if you have a period, you just do... <laughs> well, it's simple. That's a period. Now comes a dash. A dash is... <laughs> Now you have a period under dash. Now comes an exclamation point. An exclamation point is a vertical dash with a period underneath. So now you can figure out what that is. <laughs> All right, I'll help you. <laughs> exclamation point. Now, a comma. Comma is very simple. Just... <laughs> and quotation, quotation mark are two commas. Yes. <laughs> now, the most difficult of them all is the question mark. It takes almost two men to learn it. <laughs> I think we are enough here, anyway, to, to learn it. And here's the question mark. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have only a, a, a colon left. A colon is a funny little sign. It contains of two small dots. You put them over or under each other as you <laughs> prefer it. <laughs> and if you don't want to do that, you can do it the other way. <laughs> and now I have a little book here written by Shakespeare. And uh, it contains a couple of short stories. And but I just find one. But so you can get an idea how it sounds. But when... Uh, <laughs> Just find the right well, one here. Here. Here's one right in the middle of the book on page two. <laughs> it happened in the year 1296. In the open window there suddenly came light. <laughs> Beautiful Eleanor sat alone dreaming of but one thing. <laughs> Two years had passed <laughs> since she met Sir Henry. <laughs> she could still remember the unhappy evening <laughs> when her father had thrown him out. <laughs> they had been sitting in the park and Henry had said, Darling, <laughs> is this the first time you have loved? <laughs> and she had answered, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but it is so wonderful that I hope it will not be the last. Suddenly, she heard a well-known sound. She heard it again, again, and again. It was he. In two strides, he was near her. Embraced, kissed, and caressed her. <laughs> Henry! <laughs> what is love? <laughs> she asked. He answered, Well, I cannot live without... He asked, where have all your thoughts been in this while? And he had answered, with thee, O oh maiden. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm sorry, this is wrong. <clears throat> this should have been a there, but... <laughs> Suddenly he was gone. 
All she heard was the well-known sound of his retreating horse. Thank you, Victor Borger. Not long ago, an army chaplain came out of the North Atlantic to pay a little visit to Washington, D.C. He's back again with his detachment. But we know that he and his boys are listening tonight, for here's the number of the great musical organization we promised him. For the boys at APO numbers 858 and 859, the King's Men and Hay Mabel. Thank you, Kingsmen. Somewhere in the canal zone is a staff sergeant, A.N.D., who wrote on June the 7th and said, I wish I could tell you just where we are so you could understand why command performance means so much to us. Brother, we're really tucked away from the bright light. So it's a wonderful thrill to hear the voices of our famous stars each week and every week. But there are several voices we'd especially like to hear. One is the unusual voice of that distinguished cinema star... Donald Duck. <laughs> and here with Donald Duck, his sidekick, that great mental giant who greets you with... <laughs> oh, everybody. Hello, oh, Mr. Traitor. <laughs> Hello, Goofy, and welcome to Command Performance. Now, Donald and Goofy, I was noticing that... Uh... Oh, Pluto, we're sorry, we're sorry. We completely overlooked... <laughs> now, Donald, I was about to tell the boys overseas that you and Goofy and Pluto have prepared a special message to Adolf Schickelgruber. <laughs> yes. And if you like now, you, you may transmit that message. Go right ahead, boys. Tell Hitler what you think of him. Thank you, Donald Duck and Goofy and Pluto, for filling the request of Sergeant A.N.D. in the Canal Zone. And thanks to Walt Disney for letting you boys out tonight. 
Now, while Donald is cooling off, let's answer a lot of command performance mail. And that particular letter written on June the 6th by WJB, JJD, and JRS on the USS Argonne. It's Sleepy Lagoon by the sweetheart of the USS Argonne, Pat Friday. Thank you, Pat Friday. And now, fellows, two very famous stars step forward to answer hundreds of your letters. Letters from the jungle mutters of Panama. From Sergeant G.P.G. and his gang in Cuba. From the three musketeers from Muskegon, now in North Ireland. From those 12 grease monkeys somewhere in Australia. And from all corners of the earth, by worldwide command of the AEF, Groucho Marx and Barbara Stanwyck. Groucho Marx and Barbara Stanwyck. Tonight, they are John and Mary Thorndike. Yes, John and Mary Thorndike. What a pair. Boy, what a pair. John, the virile and vivacious in the cloak of Groucho Marx. And Mary, Mary his splendid spouse in the shoes of Barbara Stanwyck, size four double E. A stranger gazing at their quiet stucco home by the waterfall could hardly have guessed the furies and passions beating within. And yet all day long a heated argument has been raging, and now as evening falls, we find John and Mary cooling off in their hammock on the porch. John. It's no use, matey. It's no use. We can't keep this up. You mean... Yes, I do. I'm through. I'm through rocking on this hammock. Back and forth, back and forth. It gets monotonous. Well, how else could you rock? To and fro is a good way. <laughs> or hither and yon. 
Really, Mary, uh, sometimes I wish you'd gone to school. John, you haven't given me your decision yet about the money for Olive. Olive? Who's Olive? John, Olive is that daughter of ours. Which daughter? We have only one daughter, John. Hmm, that simplifies it. <laughs> that must be the one, then. Please, John, I want to speak to you about her. Is it about money again? Yes, John. What'd you say? I said, yes, John. John? Who's John? <laughs> You're John, dear. That's right, so I am. I must remember that. <laughs> what were we talking about? About Olive. Olive? Who's Olive? <laughs> Our daughter, John. Oh, yes, that, that girl is driving me crazy. She thinks I'm made of money. She's too extravagant, matey. Not one cent. Not one red cent, matey. Oh, John, she's young. She's beautiful. You know, John, you're only young and beautiful once. No, oh, matey, uh, I'm not so young. <laughs> I don't think I can stand it much longer. The way you two act. We sit at dinner. Olive staring at you. You staring at Olive. You don't speak. Why? Don't you like Olive? I like pickles. <laughs> I, uh, I'll have to cultivate a taste for Olive. Oh, John, is terrible. The very atmosphere is charged. I meant to speak to you about that, Mary. Everything is charged around here. <laughs> it's got to stop. You don't know the value of money. But it's not for me, John. It's Olive. Olive? Who's Olive? <laughs> Please, she's our daughter. We have a lot of children, haven't we? No, just one. And she must have nice things. Oh, John, dear, you must expect to spend money on a pretty girl. I, I always did. What? I, I mean I love you, matey. And don't forget, I, I worked hard for my money. Until you married me. Remember, dear, I'm a Thorndike. I gave you my name in exchange for your money. <laughs> now I have your money and you have my name. And I have my name and your money. Oh, it's all so confused and complicated and confused. John, I just can't have my daughter staying behind while her friends enjoy the pleasure and niceties of life. She's a Thorndike, John. Who's a Thorndike? <laughs> Olive, our daughter. Naturally. Well, what do you say, John? Yes or no? Yes, I say no. <laughs> you can't refuse your own flesh and blood. Maybe I, I don't want to refuse her. It's uh, just that we've got to be careful now of money. Now of, now of all times. Have I told you how things are down at the office? No. Well, you... You mean... Worse than that. Oh, oh, I didn't know. Oh, then, John, maybe we shouldn't. No, maybe, because I love you. I'll call the bank and see if they can do something. Oh, you're fair, John. And square. Give me that phone. Hello, operator. Give me the last national bank. <laughs> Hello, bank. Give me the receiving teller. Hello, receiving? How are you? How's my balance? What do you care who this is? I'm asking you a civil question. I expect a civil answer. <laughs> How's my balance? All right, I'll let you in on a secret. This is Thorndike. Now then, how do I stand? Hmm. I'm a bit surprised myself. Is it really that bad? It is? Well, I guess it is. Goodbye, receiving. What did he say, John? He didn't say. It was after 3 o'clock and the bank was closed. <laughs> well, John, I know you'll do the right thing as you see it. And perhaps it was wrong of me to ask you to spend the money. It was just that I... Oh, I felt so sorry for Olive. Olive? Who's Olive? <laughs> John, Olive is our daughter. How nice. Well, if you put it that way, maybe I can't resist. Tell, uh, tell whatever her name... What did you say her name was? Olive. Oh, well, uh, tell her she can have the money. Oh, John, you're wonderful. You're fine. Olive will be so proud and happy. Oh, John, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Oh, stop your nagging. <laughs> At a time like this, always kissing. But you do mean it, John. You will give Olive the money. Yes, I'll give it to her, although it takes the last penny I've got. How much does she want? Um, Twelve dollars. Twelve dollars? <laughs> 
he wants to buy a pair of alligator shoes. She'll spoil the beast. <laughs> I never heard of an alligator wearing shoes. <laughs> but I'll give you the money, matey. Yes, I'm doing a noble thing. Oh, noble, John. I'm a Thorndike. I'm doing a thing that will outlive marble and the gilded monuments of princes. Oh, beautiful. Am I really? Say it again, Mary. Keep on saying it. Perhaps you think it's... Oh, better. nonsense. She shall have it. Why, nothing's too good for Olive. Olive? Who's Olive? <laughs> Who? Olive. Who's she? I don't know, but I've seen you someplace before. <laughs> Mister, we're packing up those command performance mail bags for tonight. But you know by now that this big show of yours will be on deck again next week. That's a promise. And here in the USA, a promise is something we keep. In the Axis world, they keep a promise just long enough to break it. This is Spencer Tracy, then, thanking you for this invitation to your own personal radio show. And speaking of shows, you're playing the leading role in the biggest show on Earth. And you're doing fine. And listen, then, if a certain little guy with a black mustache and a black heart thinks he can get a free pass to your show, tell him he's paying the full price. But give him a very special seat, the hot seat. Good night. Okay there, men, we're sounding taps on another command performance. The great stars you've heard tonight, Spencer Tracy, Mary Lee, Victor Borge, the King's Men, Pat Friday, Donald Duck and Goofy, Lou Forbes and the orchestra, Groucho Marx and Barbara Stanwyck, say thanks for those letters. Just keep those letters rolling in to command performance and care of the station to which you're listening, and you'll be listening to your favorite stars each week. This is Paul Douglas reminding you that the dictators are feeling pretty miserable these days, but they haven't got long to wait. Uncle Sam's coming over there to put them out of their misery. <laughs>